Inferno 16 begins with Dante encountering three illustrious citizens of Florence, Guido Guerra, Tegaio Aldobrandi, and Jacopo Rusticucci. These men are known to and apparently revered by Dante, and they make two requests of him. The second of the two has by this point become standard fare in Inferno. See that you speak of us to others, they say. The first request is that Dante offer a State of the Union address on Florence. Tell us if valor and courtesy still live there in our city, as once they used to do, or have they utterly forsaken her? Dante's response to this Florence-specific request prepares us for the central tension of Inferno 16. The new crowd with their sudden profits have begot in you, Florence, such excess and arrogance that you already weep. Then the poet offers this comment. This, my face uplifted, I cried out. And the three, taking it for answer, looked at one another as men do when they face the truth. For our purposes, the actual historical facts underlying their request and Dante's response are less significant than the poet's commentary on the way in which he spoke and the unspoken way in which they responded. Dante, addressing Florence directly and not the three Florentine interlocutors, cries out a threnody for the lost valor and courtesy of his beloved city, which has been overrun by the vulgar excess and arrogance of the nouveau riche. And the three Florentines respond, we are told, as men do when they face the truth. Through the unspoken response of the Florentines, Dante the Pilgrim is here established by Dante the Poet as a speaker of truth. They go on to encourage him always to speak with such clarity and conviction, suggesting to him that doing so will make him felice, happy. The Pilgrim gets his chance to do just that when mere lines later he and Virgil reach the extreme boundary of the seventh circle, that in which the violent have been punished, and are confronted with the massive cascade of the river Phlegathon and its roar of many waters. They have no way to descend to the circle below, which contains many pouches or malebolge, in which various forms of fraud are punished. It is then that Virgil conceives of a plan. He requires of Dante the cord he wears around his waist. Virgil makes this cord into a lasso, twirls it around his head, swings it and flings it some distance from the edge down into the depth of the abyss. And the pilgrim is left to wonder what of all possible things in heaven, on earth, in the underworld, or in the imagination of poets he might catch and draw up. It's a wonderful moment of poetic suspense. After the pilgrim thinks to himself, I wonder what new and strange thing will answer, the poet reports Virgil's response to the thoughts he has either read or intuited in the mind of his wayward charge. Virgil says, Soon what I expect, and your mind only dreams of, will appear. Soon it shall be right before your eyes. Now that is a curious claim on the part of Dante the Pilgrim's leader and true guide. The crux lies in the only of what your mind only dreams of. The Italian is somewhat simpler. Tosto verrà ciò che il tuo pensier sogna. At once will come that of which your thought dreams. This is the place where what had hitherto been dreamed of becomes true reality. And what is the character of this dream thought? After Virgil's assurance, we receive one of the most important interjections on the part of the poet himself in the entire Commedia. We might say doubly important because it is a poetic interjection involving a direct address to the reader. Dante will now reveal to us what his pilgrim self saw with his own bodily eyes rising up from the abyss. Prolonging the aforementioned poetic suspense, he prefaces the revelation by making a comment about the truth. To a truth that bears the face of falsehood, a man should seal his lips if he is able, for it might shame him, though through no fault of his own. But here, I can't be silent. A truth? that bears the face of falsehood? What can that mean? I take it to mean that when something is true but seems impossible, it's better not to be the reporter of such a fantastic truth, because telling such a truth will bring shame even through no fault of the speaker. Why would telling a fantastic truth bring shame? 
Didn't the three Florentines just praise Dante for his truthfulness and tell him that the more he could speak courageously the truth, even if it is unpopular, the more felice he will be? Now the poet is at least flirting with the idea that a man with an unbelievable truth to tell should simply keep it to himself. But it's all a tease because he goes on to tell us that he can't be silent. He will describe what Virgil lassoed and brought up from the abyss, but isn't simply going to describe it. First, he is going to do perhaps the most audacious and confusing thing he's done so far this canticle. And by the strains of this comedy, so may they soon succeed in finding favor, I swear to you, reader, that I saw come swimming up through that dense and murky air a shape to cause amazement in the stoutest heart, a shape most like a man's who, having plunged to loose the anchor caught fast in a reef or something other hidden in the sea, now rises up reaching upward and drawing in his feet. Dante has just sworn on his own poem that he saw what in the next canto is revealed to have been Garion, an Ovidian mythical creature remade by Dante and described as the filthy effigy of fraud. With a face like a man, a just man, the body of a serpent and the paws of a lion, a fierce, strong, stealthy, insidious, hypocritical liar. The perfect figure to take Dante and Virgil down to the Malebolge, where various and sundry types of dishonesty, manipulation and falsehood are punished. But is Dante merely observing this fraud, or does Geryon affect Dante in some way? Dante has been praised for being a teller of truth. He has been exhorted to speak the truth so as to be felice. Now the poet stakes the entire commedia on the fact that this pilgrim's bodily eyes saw something that we know full well Dante stole from another fantastical poet's mythological writings. In brief, Dante the poet perjures himself. What are we to make of that? Remember back in Inferno 9 when Virgil and Dante entered into Dis and were blown sideways by the horrifying, unbearable, foul stench that belched from that bottomless abyss? Dante's olfactory sense is so offended to such a degree that Virgil proposes a little break. We must delay descending so our sense, inured to that vile stench, no longer heeds it. This is very sensible advice. It is also supremely disturbing. Virgil is essentially conceding that he and Dante can only go through hell if they become acclimated to hell. They have to get used to it. Inured is our translator's word for this. To become inured is to become numb, unfeeling, and habituated to hell. Think about the risk involved in such an enterprise. Aristotle says in his rhetoric that habit forms something like a second nature within the soul. Dante the Pilgrim is forming, through habituation, an infernal nature. He presents himself in Inferno 16 as a truth teller. In line 63, he acknowledges to the three Florentines that he knows he and Virgil are going down to the very core, that is the pit of hell. Fast forward to Inferno 33, lines 115 to 117. Here, Dante the Pilgrim encounters a sinner frozen up to the neck in the ice near the very core of which Dante the Pilgrim had spoken in Inferno 16. The penultimate ring of the ninth circle, called Ptolemea, where extraordinary fraud against guests is punished. Dante makes a deal with this sinner. I will remove the ice that cakes your eyes and freezes them shut if you will tell me your name. Then, if I don't relieve it, he says, may I have to travel to the bottom of the ice? The sinner reveals himself as Fra Alberigo, but Dante does not uphold his end of the bargain. The attentive reader who remembers what was said to the three Florentines in Inferno 1663 is left at this point with three interpretive possibilities. One, Dante has forgotten the talos of his journey through hell. Two, Dante, heaven's scourge and minister, is being fraudulent with the fraudulent so as to honor the righteous God who condemned this soul to hell. Or three, Dante has become as infernal a devil as the soul he ghosts here. I take the third as the only really compelling interpretation. Dante has become inured to the stench. He has become frozen and habituated to hell. He has become the figure of fraud. Garion, whom Virgil summoned from the abyss in Inferno 16, the seemingly just man with a serpent's stinging tail. He can't help but perjure himself. This is, after all, 
hell. What does this mean for us, the readers of such a poem by such a poet?